All right, so I'm going to switch to English. Uh, the whole, the entire program is in English today. I am extremely excited and grateful to be here. I am excited because it's the first time for me to give a talk in my home country. So my name is Gergana Rusanova, and uh, today the, the talk is called A Shapeshifter Stepping Out of Definition. So I am going to, to tell you a story, and the story is about me. So it's about my journey, how I started here in Bulgaria, and how I shapeshifted uh, through different uh, locations and different, perhaps, even skills. So, I always start my talks with saying where I'm from, because I'm very proud of it. So, I am from Bulgaria. And this is how my story began uh, some years ago. Uh, maybe some of you actually know that uh, there is a university uh, called UASAK here in Sofia, right? You know that. Uh, so that's the University for Architectural, Civil Engineering and uh, Geodesy. And uh, it's extremely uh, exciting for me to show this. I think I'm showing this for the first time in such a big forum, um, because this is how I started. This was my first, um, uh, first uh, kind of touch to art, and it was here in my country. <coughs> When I was 18, I moved to Germany, which is where I studied for my bachelor's. I moved to a very industrial city called Stuttgart, and uh, I studied architecture completely there. I was extremely um, lucky to get a job in my second year of studies at an engineering office uh, called Knippers Helbig, and I was working on really inter interesting and interdisciplinary and um, uh, overall projects in the world. So you can see some facade projects, you can see some bridge projects. After some time there, I finished my studies, my bachelor studies, and I said, all right, I worked in an engineering office until now as an architectural student, not very common. How about going to a real architectural, real German architectural office for a change? So. I joined uh, an office called uh, K. Gassner, Professor K. Gassner, in Stuttgart. And I was pre predominantly working on this project back then. So my work was pretty much architectural. Do we have any architects in, in the space? Maybe? No? Yes? Well, what an architectural job involves is you draw a lot of drawings and then they get built, right? So you draw this, and then at some point you get this, okay? Super exciting, really nice, because you get like this experience of actually drawing, but then it kind of becomes physical, right? So beautiful. This is kind of a red thin line through all of my work and research, and you'll see that later. Okay, the problem with that is that a building is very nice, but it needs a lot of drawings like this. And normally when I show this, even to architects, they don't know what it is, right? And this is a drawing of a door in a scale in 1 to 20. So this is the door, okay? And so imagine for this big project, I had to draw 600 of those, okay? And this is in 2000 and what, what do we have there? 2014, right? So nothing was automated. Everything had to be drawn by me. And every time an engineer would actually change something, they would call me and I would have to go to this door and change it manually, right? So this is what I was doing for three months, drawing this. So this is where I decided I need to shape shift, okay? I cannot do this for life. And I started doing things more like that, okay? So this is a, a research pavilion uh, in Stuttgart. 
uh, as part of my master's program. So I decided I need to go back to studies. I need to study more so I know more and I can automate my processes and boost more, more my creativity. So this project was a collaboration with uh, biologists. And this is really interesting for me. You would see that uh, happening a lot through, throughout my uh, work, that I was really interested to work with specialists from other disciplines. So in this process, the biologists, I'm, I'm sorry if there are uh, people who feel bad about uh, animal studies, but this is how it was done. So the biologists had this uh, little guy here, this little beetle, um, and they cut the shell that protects its wings. And this here is a 3D scan of that shell. And we studied the shell together. And we did that because we were really interested to understand how the fibers work, because that could inform structural, the structural uh, properties of other bigger scale, the structures in a bigger scale. And so my job at this point was to look at the distribution of these fibers at the very small scale, the biological scale, and come up with an idea how we could potentially scale this up. So we used um, carbon and glass fibers to build this. And the glass fibers are the white ones, so they only uh, define the shape. And the carbon fibers are actually the ones that carry all the loads. They're the structural shape. So what I did is, I was working with some structural engineers who calculated all the loads that would happen in this shell. And they gave me this, oops, sorry, these little arrows here, right? And then I took them, and this was my first introduction to scripting. I took them and I uh, decided on what the distribution of these carbon fibers should look like. So the strong fibers that uh, define uh, the structural capability of this shell. So first introduction to programming ever. This was for me, Python. And the whole project was really interesting because it was also built with, with robotic arms back then. So that was in 2013. And here I have a little video to show you the overall process. So we have resin that is mixed and we have the glass and the carbon fibers, which you can see here. So we have like a little van where you pour the resin and then the glass fibers get dipped into it. And the robots are programmed in a way that they can rotate in space and pull from this fiber van and wind the entire shape. So on the first hand, you have the, the white fibers who define the shape. And then in a second go, we will put also the black carbon fibers as per my design and calculation. All right, second project. So we were, I was really interested in this idea of how to use materials, right? How can we innovate in architecture by using different materials? So the carbon and glass fiber um, material is actually predominantly using in um, uh, airplanes. Uh, and we adopted that idea and we looked at how could we possibly use this in architecture. With this material, the story is a bit different. So this space here, is built out of these little stars, all right? And there is no connection between the stars. So the way how it works is the stars, they're just stacked on top of each other and because of their shape, they interlock. So we use, very oddly, balloons, right? To uh, shape the space. Then pour the stars on top, and once you remove the balloons, the void is built. 
So, again, what was my task in this project? I was looking at how can we describe the, the properties of this material because it's an unknown material in the realms of architecture, right? And the way to describe it was to actually simulate it. So how does it look like what kind of forces uh, are acting on this material? And how can we describe what is happening already? So again, me, the architect, I looked into using a software that is um, predominantly using in the mining industry because this is a granular material. And engineers use that to look at how, what would happen if they would excavate the tunnel, right? And the behavior is kind of similar because the material is of the same consistency, consistency is granularity. There is no bond between the particles. So how do we do that? And I was really interested to understand how can I describe the state of this material being stable. And um, using different Using these simulation methods, um, I had to also perform statistical analysis uh, and look at how uh, are these forces within this uh, material distributed. And so I did that. And then, remember I told you that I always like to connect the, di the digital with the physical. So I was interested in seeing all right, I see this on the screen, the simulation works fine, but how does it actually look like in the real life? So then, uh, with the help of my father actually, who is here today, I built this machine together with him. Um, and, oh, sorry, I think my video, yep. And I was able to connect both worlds, digital and the physical. So whenever I would um, simulate something in the digital world, it would trigger a real-time trigger to, to, to um, inflate the balloons, right? And with this machine and this method, I was able to create these beautiful spaces. All good, but a lot of plastics, I thought, at this point. You know, carbon fibers, this material that I just showed you, plastics, plastics, plastics. So in architecture, we have this problem that we produce, or construction industry in general, we produce 40% of the waste. 40%, that's a lot. And it's because of images like this. So we build buildings, but we never really think about how are we going to disassemble them? How are we going to, de to deconstruct them? And this was a topic that really bothered me. So I moved again, moved to Switzerland, and look into, to look into how could we potentially create a material, really, that can Build, that can constitute um, buildings that are fully recyclable. And so this is a project that we did for Ars Electronica in 2017. And uh, what you see is a robotic arm mounted on a vertical axis. And it, that's pretty much like a big scale 3D printing process. So if I zoom in, into this, you would see the three different steps. So the first step is we're laying textile string, and this string is made of leftovers from the textile industry. The second step is to uh, place stones, and these stones are just the ones that you use in the railroads. Yeah? And the third step is the funniest one I find. So you just tap over to equalize the whole layer. And with that, we can build three meter tall structures, right? No binding material. 
right? It's just purely statics and gravity. Now, you see here a long list of names because this project, these kind of projects are not possible if you don't collaborate with a lot of people also from different disciplines. So you cannot shape shift if you don't collaborate. Okay, so I said textile string and we had to also program the robotic arm to tell it where to go. And this is how this looks like. So we created these paths for the uh, textile string and the robot would just simply follow. There is no artificial intelligence, intelligence in that, not yet, yeah? So the robot just follows what we tell it to do. Now, that was uh, an art festival, Ars Electronica, and we were part of the exhibition really because we were building during the exhibition so people could see the whole process. And then at some point we, at the very end, we let people touch it because people were kind of suspicious, like, wow, look at this material, like, it can just erode easily. And so in the very end, we, we were also scared of it, right? Like I would admit. So at the very end, we actually allowed them to touch it. And this triggered for me back then, a thought like, oh, maybe it is actually really important to look at the structure of performance of this material if we want to be serious about it in architecture. <coughs> and so this project was part of my PhD and I was really able to look at it in a scientific way. So I was working with a lot of people from uh, ETH uh, in Zurich, so we would collaborate from different disciplines. And that was really crucial to this project project. So in the very beginning I you know started like kind of uh, just looking at what would happen if I hit it with something very heavy which in that case this concrete block is 1.2 tons and we were just having it on a forklift and like kind of like hitting you know like what would happen right and as you can see nothing really happens <laughs> But then with these kind of videos, I was able to go to real structural engineers and say, hey, would you be interested to look into that behavior? Because without that, they would be like, you know, I'm not really interested. So, and then they gave me access to this machine. Uh, it is called the uniaxial machine. So basically what happens is, oh, sorry, the other way. So basically what happens is that you put samples that are this tall into this machine and the machine just smashes it with 100 tons, yeah? And what happens is that the material just shrinks a lot, right? So every little small cavity that is inside gets kind of filled with the stones, which is very unusual behavior for a material because normally in architecture, when you hit the limit, the material just breaks. This one doesn't. This one is like a sponge. Okay. And we knew that we want to build big. Okay. So we contacted a crazy engineer <laughs> in Zurich. And he said, uh, if you want to build big, we really, really need to test this. So I was like, okay, sure, um, okay. So this is my colleague. We did our PhDs together on this project. Beautiful person, uh, Swedish guy, trying to break it, yeah? And, and he was trying and trying. I was like, okay, give me a try, yeah? And so he didn't break it, but I did, yeah? So this is like the soft woman touch. You know? <laughs> so have a look at what's gonna happen just in about a second. So that's like half a ton of material, yeah. And I'm trying to look cool in the back, yeah. So we did these tests and many more that I'm not showing you today, but 
we finally convinced the engineers that we can actually build something with this. We can build it outdoors and we can let people go through. And this is part of an exhibition called Hello Robot that travels uh, around the world. So every time <coughs> that it happens, it's in a different place. And in this moment, it was also in Switzerland in a small, small, very cute village called Winterthur. And this is the main square of Winterthur and that's where we were. So we had to switch to, you can imagine, a mobile robot so we could actually build outdoors. And the, the red volume that you see here is basically what this robot could build without being moved. And at this moment, this was really crucial for us because we couldn't have enough, we didn't really have enough time to develop a process where the robot would be moving and deploying material at the same time. So I think this is actually really beautiful because in art, design and architecture, you always have to work with some kind of constraints. So what is constraining me at this point? And in this point, it was really the space that this guy could build without being moved. And this is how the design of the pavilion looks like. So this is just the top view where you could see these elements being placed. At the same time, of course, you also wanted to have people coming through uh, and some safety distance uh, for the ro robotic arm to be able to move around. And this was the design, right? So we have all kinds of parameters that we could play with, like the openings, uh, the depth of the openings, the different slopes, uh, the number of columns, also the articulation on these out, outside walls. And after the design was done, it was time to build, right? So we had a lot, a lot of partners in this process. We found a lot of people. I was really surprised how many people would actually want to help. Uh, if you just write, call, describe the process, and they would be like, this is crazy. Can we help you <laughs> to do it? Um, so what we did is we, we had this steel roof that I was showing in the video before, and we were using it to, as a protection to build underneath. So we first put it on four big pillars so we could uh, actually build underneath and be safe from the weather. So again, the whole thing was part of an exhibition. So it was a bit like being in the zoo, you know, because you're doing your job, you're building stuff, and then people are just like looking around and asking questions, like there, you know, or people would just read the book in the back. I don't know, sorry. Um, and we had to modify the tool that is connected to the robotic arm for, to speed up the process. And the entire process took perhaps 20 days so we could build the entire structure. Once it was done, we took the steel roof away and we put it on top. The steel roof is 8.6 tons and we had these anchors anchored in for stability and we just put it in and I remember sitting there and like, okay, did it work? Did it work? No. It did. No. So the pavilion was there for a month and I was there with my brother also, but I was there every weekend. Uh, I had, uh, oops, sorry going in the wrong direction. I had a camera installed and connected to my phone. So I would wake up every morning and look at it. Is it there? Is there someone lying underneath? Sorry. Sorry. But just to remind you again of where I started with that, the topic of recycling. So remember, no binding material between the stones and the string, right? So after a month, we took the roof apart, we took the anchors apart, no binding, nothing, 
just friction. And we disassembled it by pulling the string. So there is just one continuous string in each one of those. And if you pull it, and it looks super easy, but it took two days, so, you know. But you, if you pull it, again, I think two days is not too bad for <laughs> such scale. So if you pull it, it just crumbles back to a pile of stones and uh, a spool of string. And we had uh, an audience in the back. All right, so remember my camera? That's it. And it was really, really nice for me to see this. You know, this is probably the worst case scenario. Good morning. <laughs> so the worst case scenario is it's a rainy day. You know, the material is getting wet. You have no idea what is happening with that. Now, I have to confess that I designed the roof with a big cantilever so I can actually protect the material. Like if it rains, it doesn't get wet. Um, but this is the worst case scenario, right? And as you saw, there was just like a little kind of little fence that uh, the people from the museum here would actually put during the night because otherwise people would tend to use it as public toilet. Okay, so, uh, and then during the day they would take it off and people would just walk around freely. All right, now, the saddest part is that it's gone and this is really painful for an architect. I cannot describe it. <laughs> so, it is gone, but at least I have a 3D scan of it, so if I get lonely, you know, I can go around and... All right, at, at this moment, I kind of finished my, my PhD and I was looking for where should I go next? What should I do? And long story short, I was reading a book uh, by a very, very famous guy. You probably all know Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. So there was a guy who was a, in charge of the reconstruction of that. And I read his book and I was like, where is he now in the world? Right? I want to work with this person. And I Googled him, really. And then apply, I applied for a job. <laughs> and um, fortunately enough, I got it. So he was in Australia. And that's where I moved next. So this is a, a, a shot that I took in February this year. And, uh, you know, I mean, just look at that. Life there, it's chilled, you see, for people, animals, like really nice, yeah? But so going back to the job, yeah? So I was, for three years, I was the lecturer in architecture and uh, as part of the School of Design and Architecture at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. I believe they hired me because they had this lab with this big guy and they didn't know what to do with it <laughs> or who should you know, be in charge of it somehow. So I got involved in uh, using it and also uh, teaching students. So again, shape-shifting, uh, becoming a teacher, big thing. Okay, we went there in November 2019 and COVID hit. How do you teach students? online to use robots, right? This is how. <laughs> so we used uh, simulation software and you know, students were really down at this moment because imagine you're locked and in Melbourne it was really bad, the lockdown. So I think it was really, really nice for them to do this. So we kind of said, pick your favorite song and make the robot dance to it in a simulation. And that's what they did. And then some of them got really creative about it, right? So they mounted like, yeah, interesting stuff. Some of them got 
really creative with the uh, generation of the geometry uh, that the robot would actually follow afterwards. Um, so you see here the robotic arm in the middle of this bubble and then the, the drawing basically kind of dancing around it. So they had complete freedom to go crazy with it. And they kind of did. I mean, you, with this one you would see, it kind of scares me a little bit. But, I don't know, wait for it. You know, no judging. It's like, whatever they decide, they got the freedom to do. All right, so in my last year there, I was the deputy department chair for architectural industrial design which basically means that I was helping the chair to oversee uh, six disciplines. And this was amazing because I could work with uh, people from industrial design, product design, engineering, interior architecture. So the people that I know we speak the same language, but not really, you know? So kind of like having these conversations with them was amazing. And we had uh, joint teaching projects where Students in fourth year in product design engineering would design tools uh, for the robotic arms. In this case, I don't know why, I don't remember why, but we decided that we want to pick up with the robot ping pong balls. And so that was the assignment for the students. Design a tool that can pick up ping pong balls. You know? And then my students in architecture, so we kind of uh, had like this joint collaboration. My students in architecture would grab this tool and they would design building structures with ping pong balls. Why not, right? Um, so there were these really beautiful little collaborations in teaching also happening. Okay, this is last project that I want to show you. Um, this was last year in 2022, uh, just before I left. Um, and it's a beautiful collaboration that we did with a design studio called United Make. Um, we had a client, which was uh, an office building in the CBD, so the city center of Melbourne. And they just thought that their lobby is kind of boring. So they said, can you do something about it? Okay. And then we decided to build a garden with hybrid plants. So, and on top of that, these plants, they're not just there, like uh, non-movable artifacts, but they actually react to people. So if you close, uh, come close to them, they would do something, yeah? Like this guy, this guy would flap its wings. And this again was done with students. So it was a beautiful collaboration that we did and gave the students the opportunity to um, get in touch with industry, if you like, and uh, build these beautiful objects that respond to people. And this is just a, a video showing my great students doing their work. I just want to show you what the things we're doing actually in the end. So if you would come close. Oh. Let's see. So if you would come close to, to them, they would react to you. And some of them were like really aggressive, like these spiders, but some of them were really subtle and sensitive. Like these flowers, for example, as well. So this was this um, exhibition. Uh, I think one of my students got a job interview after that. Really good, huh? Okay, and um, yeah, for me it was also really important to show them how, or to teach them, how to describe these objects on paper. How do you communicate a movement, for example, in a static image, right? And this is a really tricky business. 
and uh, I'm actually really happy with the results. What I wanted to show you with this is that, you know, one of my students came to me and he was like, oh, I didn't know that architecture is, could be that. And, and I was like, yeah, why not? And then he was like, oh, thank you. So I felt really good because, you know, I guess I was feeling already like a shape shifter, but then after this project, I felt like I can have like a little army of shape shifters as well. And this was really, really encouraging, like just to give that to a new generation. Anyway, I'm back to Europe now, Germany. I'm working in a structural engineering office, um, going back to see what the industry really looks like, what are the real challenges. And that was me, thank you. I want to say that there is a lot, a lot of images in this presentation that are done by my super, super talented brother, Martin Rusunov. So, um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation.